Bum, bum, bum. Awesome. Very good. Well, welcome this morning. I'm Pastor Troy, and we're so glad you are here this morning. Excited about all that God is doing in and around us. We'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper at the end of the service today. So you've picked a great day to be here with us. And um, I wanted to just, uh, two things I wanted to talk to you about, but as Bruce, he said, hey, can you stall for a few minutes? I'm like, I can stall for a lot of minutes. But two things are very important this morning. One is tonight, we are having a meeting for anybody who is interested in going to South Asia. And, uh, and if you're interested in going on any type of mission trip, we would welcome you to come. But if you're thinking about going to South Asia, we absolutely need you to be here because that trip is going to be in June. And, uh, and we need to talk about getting tickets and make sure you have a passport and all those very important things. So if you have any interest in doing that, uh, be here tonight, 6 o'clock. Be at 6 o'clock tonight. We will be meeting at the bridge. There will be Bible study in here as normal. Clayton will be leading that. And then I will be at the bridge for that missions interest meeting. Um, and if you can't be here, but you do want to go, then uh, do like Avis did. She's in Wyoming, so she just sent me a message. Say, hey, I want to go. Make sure you get me all the information. So I will do that. So just let me know that you want to go. And uh, if, you, if you just have interest in going or want to know more about it, that's fine, too. I'll be glad to tell you all you want to know and more. Uh, and uh, all you have to do is just let me know that you want to be a part of it. That's uh, The cool part about it is, is on this trip, we will be distributing... Operation Christmas Child Boxes. So uh, we collect them every Christmas, and then they go out all over the world and are distributed to countries all over the world. We are partners with a church that is part of that distribution part, so we are going to help them distribute to a community. And, uh, and so it's really, really a cool experience. Uh, so just uh, if you'd like to be a part of that, then let me know. Second thing is this is our Annie Armstrong Easter collection time. Uh, we're going to watch a video about that here in just a little bit, but uh, just to, so you understand, Annie Armstrong is for the North American Mission Board. That's everything, all our missions activity in the United States and Canada, and that money goes to help church planters, and there are a variety of different ministries that that goes towards disaster relief ministries and such, uh, and so uh, that's, a, that's a, it's a very important offering, and we have two offerings. We, we do one at Christmas, one at Easter, and and this one is, uh, is, they're both important. That's why we collect. And, but both of those offerings, when we collect the one at Christmas time, 100% of that money goes to our people in the field internationally. When we collect the offering this time, 100% of that money goes to the field in North America and Canada. And so, or when North America. United States and Canada, which is North America. So they, uh, the, uh, so that's, that's what that's about. So we'll watch that video in a second. Jim, this is one announcement that to, to, I said two things, but I'm going to add this one, throw this one in. And that is next week, next week, we are celebrating Easter, resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is one of the greatest opportunities we have to invite people to church. We've, norm, we've been doing it at the band shell. Uh, uh, last year we did the band shell and a few years back. This year it's going to be here. It'll be here at 10 a.m., 10 a.m. I say that. Because if you're not listening to me, you'll get here 35 minutes late if you get here at this time. So it's at 10 a.m. next week. There will be no Sunday school next week, just one service, 10 a.m. We'll all meet in here and celebrate together. I hope, I hope we can, this, we can fit 300 people in here if we don't bring in chairs. We want to have to bring in chairs. We want to have to bring in chairs and put people around the edges and put leave people on the stage and do whatever we got to do to fit everybody in here. That's what we want to happen. So, uh, so but that requires you see all those gaps around you. That means you have to ask somebody to come to fill those gaps. Uh, and and we will be presenting the gospel next week. That's one of the one of the, the one service I promise and guarantee you already know what I'm going to preach. I'm just going to be preaching how to be saved. And so how people can come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So if you're like, I already know that, then good. Then you can bring somebody. And if you, and we lose, run out of chairs or space, then you give somebody up your seat and you can greet people in the lobby or something like that. But uh, that's whatever the case, we're trying to pack this place to give people an opportunity to hear the gospel. It's a great opportunity to invite your one. You know, you've been praying for somebody to be saved. This is a great, say, hey, why don't you go to church with me on Easter? So, uh, and then one service, 10 a.m., and, uh, and we'll all be here together to worship. So let me pray for us. We got an Annie Armstrong uh, video we're going to let you see about some mission work that's going on, and, uh, and then we will, uh, and then Bruce is going to come out and start our worship. 
So let's pray. Father, we just thank you, God, for how great and amazing you are. Lord, thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you for Mason, Lord, just making it, being a testimony, Lord, of, of his faith in Jesus Christ. Father, so many, Lord, it's so exciting. It's so exciting to have to fill the baptistry up on a regular basis, Lord, to, to have people walking in faith and, and, and sharing their faith and, and people coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through the proclamation of the gospel. And, and so, Lord, I pray that it inspires all of us. I pray, Lord, for anybody who doesn't know you, Lord, who, who's not put their trust in you. See uh, how easy it is to put their trust in you and, and, Father, begin that life of faith. But, Father, to also see that we all need to be taking that gospel, that good news to other people and sharing it. So, Father, that there's so many still who need to hear, who need to know. Lord, we have an opportunity to reach our generation for Jesus Christ, to see the kingdom of God expanded, see people rescued from hell, and, Lord, to gain heaven. And so, Lord, I pray, God, that we will just be your people on mission. Thank you, Lord, for how you've blessed us. And now, Lord, may your spirit guide and direct us this morning that we all grow closer to you. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Who's in my family? Yeah, if you looked at a picture of ours, we'd certainly look different. We have two biological children. We have three adopted children. So certainly if you look at a photo, you see brown hair, you see dark skin, you see blonde hair. And certainly we do get weird looks, but the great thing is seeing the Lord work and do things that you never even dreamed possible. The call to adopt came out of intimacy with the Lord, just like our calling to plant this church. I'm the church planting pastor of Refuge Church in the Ortega community of Jacksonville. We've been here about two and a half years. It was a community that was very unreached, and being there, the Lord just began to kind of do something in our heart. We didn't set out to plant a church for foster and adoptive families. It really just happened. The Lord did it. A lot of our church has become people from this community who are fostering or who are adopted. So we share that in common. People are longing for community. And when you add the layer of taking on people and children from difficult places, it's not easy. It's not comfortable. I think the reason they've shown up here, there's a big closet full of diapers and shoes and strollers and car seats. And they see that and they come here to get a need met. Through that, they build a relationship. Next thing we know, they're in our church on a Sunday. And I think about the amount of children who come to our church who, if families didn't say yes to foster care and adoption, uh, those, those children would never hear about Jesus. They'd never hear the gospel. This is the calling that God has for us. And when people give to Annie Armstrong, you're able to support those who are on the front lines of gospel work. And people hear the gospel who would never have a chance to hear the gospel.
What you did on that cross you could have turned that cup away but you decided that because of your love for us that you would endure it and we're forever grateful this morning we give you praise in jesus precious name and all god's people said amen let's stand together and worship so quiet. Hey, listen, I want you to just look at your neighbor right now and just say, smile. God loves you. That's right. He does. Amen. So let's do it.
stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross until my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. I love this last verse. Here we go. To the old rugged cross. Come on, sing it. I will ever be true. It's shame and reproach gladly. Now this claim, this promise, here we go. Then he'll call me son. That's right. To my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trouble. At last I lay down, I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the promises that are in this song, and we just give you praise, Lord. Now, as we, in this service, as we just take the time to open your word and hear from you, we ask that you open our minds and our hearts and our spirit to what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, come on. That's not a foul. Oh, wings are ready. Hey, uh, let, me, let me ask you something real quick. Yeah. Go ahead and have a seat. Okay. Hey, um, asking for a friend. Mm -hmm. What would a person's general thought be about scheduling or doing something on, 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 a, on a Sunday? Well, I think, uh, generally speaking, most people like their Sundays to themselves. But asking for a friend. Yeah. What if there was something special about the Sunday, generally speaking? Generally speaking, it'd have to be really special. I mean, like a, like a showstopper. Right, right, right. So what if someone was raised from the dead. I mean, would, would that be showstopper enough? What's well, bigger than being dead and then not being dead? Right, right. Yeah. What, what if said person was the son of God? Go on. And the miraculous act is through him he could save you from save your- Save you from my what? From your Sins. Oh. Asking for a friend. Asking for a friend. Do you think a friend would like to go to something like that on a Sunday morning, if invited? Tell your friend mm. that uh, if he doesn't invite somebody to that, he's probably not really a friend. Right. Right? Right. 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 I'm the friend. It was me the whole time. And the Oscar goes to Meryl Streep. I love her. There you see, it is so easy to invite someone to come next week. And if they don't have a ride, provide them a ride. If you don't 
need to provide them a ride, then call someone who has the ability to provide them a ride. But get them here. That's the idea. Take, a, take the obstacles out of the way as much as you can to make sure that uh, they're here. Again, so we have the opportunity to share the gospel with them. We have a, a series that we're doing for the next four weeks called Holy Week and Beyond. After we get done with this series, then we'll be celebrating our 200th anniversary as a church. It's exciting, and it, that's April 21st and 28th, and so be paying attention to all the things that will be happening uh, during that period of time. And, uh, and just so, I mean, we get one shot at this. I probably, I probably won't be here for the 300th anniversary. I'm going to, I'm just saying. Not that I don't love everybody, but I'm just saying, probably not going to be here. Um, so let's, let's, we want to make this a great celebration. But uh, don't want to take away from probably, you know, the, as we celebrate Holy Week, and, and that's, Holy Week is today, Palm Sunday, through next week, which is Resurrection Sunday. And, uh, and we, we have so many things through church history that are done to this period of time. We, you know, as, when you're Baptists and, and kind of uh, just who we are, evangelicals, we don't really emphasize it as much. And the reason is, is because uh, we think every week is Resurrection Sunday. I mean, we celebrate, worship the Lord on the first day of the week. And, uh, and we've been doing that for I don't know, a couple thousand years, and uh, we and we do that, uh, but we but we also see an opportunity, an opportunity when the world pays attention. When Christmas and Easter are just two days when people get focused on religious things when they don't normally. I mean, you go to the store, all the decorations and everything. I mean, I, I know we get really freaked out over the fact that there are Easter eggs and bunnies and and things like that, but don't lose sight of this. They are talking about a holy day, uh, they're talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's in there. It's in there. They, they may not know it's in there, but it's in there. We are the ones. I, I don't expect Walmart to convey that message. I don't expect Target to get that word out. We get that word out. We let people know why this is an important time and to share with them an opportunity to put their faith in Jesus Christ and understand that it, his resurrection is what this is all about. I mean, this is really, it's the, it's the henchman, it's everything. It's, it's the fact that if we don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then we're just silly people getting together for no good reason. Because this is all about, all about the fact that we believe he rose from the dead and that we also now will rise from the dead and be with him for all eternity. Our sins are forgiven on the cross. The resurrection promises us eternal life. And then the Holy Spirit being given gives us the power to overcome all that is, uh, all the evil that is in the world to make us who we need to be in order to spend eternity with God. Sin damaged us. Jesus made it possible for us to be forgiven and makes it possible for us to live forever. It is a sweet deal, a sweet deal that we are wanting to communicate to everybody. And today, uh, we're talking about a word. A word that is uh, in um, the New Testament called Hosanna. Hosanna is a word that simply means save now. Save now. Yashana is what it is in the Hebrew. And it comes from Psalm 118, which is considered a messianic psalm, meaning a prophecy about Jesus. And the people cried out, Yashana means save now. And it became an exclamation in Greek, uh, Hosanna. And people would say it when they were crying out for whoever it is they're putting their faith and trust in to bring salvation to them. It could be shouted to a king. It could be shouted to a military ruler. It could be shouted to whoever. But when the people of God are gathered together to do it, it was they were shouting it for Jesus. They were shouting for Jesus. Now, let me kind of set the stage as what's happening here. You have uh, a big event Passover is taking place in Jerusalem, and people come from all the surrounding regions to be near the temple to celebrate the Passover. One thing that we kind of lose sight of is that Jesus grew up north of Jerusalem in a place called Galilee, and in that region around the Sea of Galilee, that's where the majority of his ministry was. That's where all the miracles are taking place. So you have all these people who are up there in, uh, in, uh, in Galilee, kind of like think of St. Louis versus Cape Girardeau just turned around. Uh, if something big was happening in Cape Girardeau and we all went to St. Louis, 
Nobody in St. Louis would really care what was happening in Cape Girardeau, but we would care. We would be excited about it. And so this is what's happening. The outline region, they're all coming in and, and, and coming into the city, and the people who are coming with Jesus are proclaiming that he is, they believe he's going to be the king. They've seen him do amazing things. He has raised people from the dead. It's be blind eyes see, lame people walk, but raised people from the dead. This is it. This is the guy. And so they're having this huge entourage coming in. And, of course, the people in Jerusalem are like, what is going on? In fact, a little bit annoyed, a little bit perturbed, a little bit skeptical about what's going to happen. Now, kind of just as a spoiler, I'm just going to tell you how it all unfolds because next week we're going to focus on the gospel. This is my one shot here to really get you behind the scenes. But here's what's happening. They're going to go into the city. Jesus is going to start turning over things in the temple, and he's going to make a big deal about the fact that they're turned his father's house into a den of thieves. That's not going to be received super well. And, and so while he has this big entourage of outsiders coming in, proclaiming him, the Jews in town are really skeptical, super skeptical. In fact, by the end of the week, by the end of the week, they are calling for his crucifixion. They arrest him and have him crucified. That's how quickly things turned around. So you have his disciples super excited about what's getting ready to happen and crying out, save us now. The reason why they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us now, save us now, save now, is because they believe that he is going to liberate them from the Roman Empire. They believe that he's going to set the Pharisees straight and the Sadducees straight. All the political corruption that's come, they believe now we have a righteous leader who is going to. We we get excited about that. We get excited about political candidates, you know, and, and about what they can do. And we get excited in elections, and we wear hats and pens and so forth, and, and think, oh, we're so excited about this leader. Imagine if the leaders we were supporting had raised people from the dead. That would be a little bit more exciting, wouldn't it? I mean, if the, if the, if the leaders we were supporting and getting excited about, that they had made blind people see and so forth. We just decided when they, you know, can get through a speech without messing up. That's, that gets us excited. Uh, but, but this was Jesus. So you can imagine the fervor, the frenzy that is taking place. You can also imagine the massive disappointment when it all went away, when it all went away. But it, it, it is a reminder that the resurrection is the key. When we come back next week to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're not just simply saying, hey, this is a great holiday. We're saying, this changed the world. This had never happened before. Never happened since. I mean, the Son of God came. They believed him to be the king. They had their hopes dashed when it didn't turn out the way they thought it was going to turn out. But it actually turned out something so much greater. Because he was sacrificed. And here's a phrase we're going to hear today and we'll hear next week. And that is, they didn't understand things at first. And we don't. And sometimes that may be you today. You, you're, you may be in, uh, you may understand things about Christianity you may understand some things about the religion, and you may just be here because this is what you think this is what we're supposed to do, but understand there's, there's some stuff that's underneath the surface that the disciples didn't get either. And once we pull those things out and really understand what's taking place, it's exciting. It's exciting. So let's look in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. Now he is in chapter 11 is when he raises Lazarus from the dead. And in verse 12, it says, The next day when the large crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and went out to meet him. They kept shouting, Hosanna, save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. However, when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Meanwhile, the crowd, which had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify 
This is also why the crowd met him, because they heard he had done this sign. Then the Pharisees said to one another, You see, you've accomplished nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Pray with me. Father, I just thank you, God, for how amazing and awesome you are. And, and Lord, Lord, it's, we've become a religious people. Father, sometimes we, we've gotten so inundated with things in the Bible and with religious tradition and with all the things that we're, it becomes a part of our life, a compartment in our life, Lord. But Father, I pray, God, that today we will be able to break through all that and see you as a God who loves us, who we were lost from because of our own sin, separated from you because of our sin. And you made a provision for that. Lord, you, you sent your son Jesus to die for our sins. So that if we would just simply believe in him, that we wouldn't perish, we wouldn't die as a result of our sin, Lord, but we could have eternal life. Lord, you demonstrated your power over death through the resurrection of your son and the fact that he is alive today, that he is not some spirit being floating, that he has a real body that will last forever. And Lord, you will give us real bodies that will last forever. Just as he has, so shall we. Father, may we just be excited about that. Lord, may it help us to, to let go of this world and the things in it and to embrace the world to come. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a few things come out of here that are happening that I, I think are super important for us to really just be excited, again, preparing ourselves to be excited about the resurrection. Because if there's one thing that will really not help next week when we're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ is if the already current followers of Jesus Christ are the people who are the most bitter and unhappy people. Sometimes we just let the world around us drag us into it. That's what was happening with the Pharisees. It really is a contrast. You have these people who are shouting and proclaiming Hosanna, and you got these people in town who are going, all religious people, all people who say they follow God, but you got one group of people who's going, ah, this again. You know, this is, nothing's turning out the way we want it to turn out. And another group of people are just super excited. And so I, I just, I want us to look at this passage and find the things that help us to be super excited. And the first thing, I, I was looking at the first one as they were shouting, I remembered uh, a phrase from a song, when I was in high school, it actually came out years ago, uh, and it's this phrase, you know you make me want to shout. I thought about playing it and getting everybody to sing it this morning. But when I was in high school, they would play this song, and a movie called The Blues Brothers had come out, and they reintroduced this song that came out years ago, and, and, um, and they were singing it in the movie. And, uh, and if you have no idea what it is, wow, you are lame. Um, <laughs> But, um, but it's, you know, you make me shout, and it, and it was a little part, they go a little bit softer now, a little bit softer now, a little bit softer now, and then a little bit louder now, a little bit louder now. And, and what was interesting about this at our high school dances is that nobody, there was, you know, some people who would dance and some people that would sit around in chairs and so forth and not really do anything. But when this song would come on, just about every single person who was there would get out on the floor and just really get involved in this time. And it was just, they loved the energy of it. And it was just, everybody's just really, and everybody loses himself in it. And it's because we all, the words were easy to, uh, uh, really, really easy. It really is, if you think about it, you may want to shout and uh, raise my hands up and, and, you know, and dance and so forth. Reason why I bring it up, that's what they were doing on the day Jesus came into town. They were raising their hands up. They were shouting. Now, I want you to think about last time you remember somebody shouting in a church service. If you're Pentecostal, you don't count. You're disqualified. But I remember being a song, and I, sang, I used to sing back, back in the day. And, uh, and I was singing a song by Ray Bolts called uh, There's Still Lamb. And as I was singing the song, uh, and, uh, and it is, it's a powerful song. Uh, it says, then one of the elders said, John, don't you cry. It's all part of the plan. Then in the center of God's glorious throne, hallelujah, there's still a lamb. And when I got to that chorus... A guy in the congregation started shouting and stood up right in the service. Freaked me out. Kept singing. Freaked me out. 
But man, I was touched by that. Because this is why I thought he was picturing it in his head. He was picturing himself in heaven, and, and there was no one worthy to open the scroll. And they sing worthy, worthy of honor and praise. They were casting down crowns and praising his name. When he cried, who is worthy? I can hear Jesus saying, I am. Oh, praise God forever. There stood a lamb. <laughs> and I mean, that was, uh, it was a shout-worthy moment. I I lost, I mean, but until that moment, I was just singing a song that I practiced and rehearsed, you know, and just singing and so forth as you're, I'm performing. But when he stood up and shouted, the performing turned to worshiping, to worshiping. And, and I think that's what happens to us. I think we don't worship anymore. We perform. You know, it's like, I don't really feel like singing this song. So I don't think I think the reason why you don't feel like singing songs or whatever about it is because you're wanting to perform. You're perform. You become performance oriented. You know, is this the right key or is this? How does this make my voice sound? What other people think about me and so forth? But I. But sometimes there's just moments where we lose ourselves in the moment because we're just so excited, elated with the object of our worship, with the object of our worship. Um, I. I tend to get more excited at basketball games than I do at church. I'm not going to say I'm grateful Kentucky went out in the first round, but yeah. But anyway, go Duke. Oh, man. You just know how to pour salt in wounds, don't you? But the truth is, is I, I, I've had so many preachers over the years say, I wish the church would get as excited at church as they do at basketball games because we're singing about, talking about something, something much more exciting. And, and, and the truth is, I don't, I don't want to say things to make you generate that or to make you feel like you should do it, fake it. But I do think that you should take time to meditate upon it, to picture it in your head, how amazing it's going to be when we're in the presence of Jesus Christ and he saves us from this world. Look in chapter 12, verse 12. The next day when the large crowd that had come to the festival, they were coming not to see Jesus, they were coming to something that we all come to, a celebration, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him. They kept shouting, Hosanna, save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And they're, they're excited. They really believe this is the King, that the King is, is here. And... Uh, and here's all I want to say. Don't be afraid to shout to the Lord. I mean, really, sometimes you just need to really get your, let yourself get lost in the moment and shout to him and shout to him. I don't know where we change. I don't know where it shifted. I mean, I do. I, I actually have studied church history. I know where it shifted. But I hate that it shifted to some degree. And I know, I know the fastest growing denominations worldwide are the ones that shout. <laughs> Because people want to be a part of something where people shout and they're excited about what's happening. Don't be afraid to shout. I, I have not instructed the deacons to rebuke you should you shout and get excited about Jesus. I, I just, I, but I want, it, I want it to be sometimes just good to get lost in the Word and to see it and to visualize it and, this, and to think this is really good stuff. And to, uh, and just to, to shout out to the Lord. I, I hope that you'll do it in your, in your quiet times. I hope that you'll do it in the car, listen to a particular song, that it will just evoke a shout out of you. Those are good things. Good things. And the next, very next thing, your king is coming. Your king is coming. Here's, here's a reason to shout. And I, I, you know, when um, I was thinking about this, when you talk about your king is coming, when I, uh, the phrase, uh, dad is home, is kind of similar. Dad is home. 
You know, when, you, when I heard the phrase growing up, dad is home, that would evoke different emotions based on what I was doing. <laughs> that could be good or bad. And I, and I think when we say your king is coming, I think how you feel and how you re- the reason, one of the reasons we don't shout is because we're more afraid of him then we are excited about him coming. I think we got, when we, that's one of the dangers of prosperity. When we become prosperous, we begin to enjoy our prosperity. We enjoy our stuff. And then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up, and we're afraid he's going to make us part with our stuff. And, spoiler alert, he is. You are going to have to part with your stuff. We have two funerals in three weeks. And quickly, and if you've ever been through this, you know the funeral's the easy part. There's two households of stuff that have to be cleared out. And that's just rough. And it's hard to let go of it. It's hard to let those stuff, that stuff go. But here's the one thing that's true. The person who had it no longer has it. But I'm going to say this. I don't think they're sad about it. I don't think they're complaining in heaven, going to Jesus, and saying, I can't believe you didn't let me bring my crock pot. I just got it. Love it. Don't think that's happening. We think that here. And that's why we, I think that's what's happened. The devil gets in our head and we start, we start thinking king is coming is a bad thing. Look at this passage. says, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it just as it is written. Don't be afraid, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. However, when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. So as it's, as it's unfolding, they don't even remember. They don't know this. Is, they don't know Psalm 118 says this, and it's a messianic psalm. These are things that we've had time to go back and look at and get excited about. And sometimes that's just what we need to do. We need to go back and look at things and get excited about it all over again. And here's, just, here's the admonition here. Don't be afraid to look for your Lord. Don't be afraid to look for Jesus and everything you got going on. In fact, that's when you're going through difficult times, when you, when you have stuff that's happening, know that it's not a bad thing to look for God in it. To look for God in it. Good and bad. Church, we need, to be, we need to be all the time looking for reasons to shout, looking for reasons to be excited, looking at aspects of our king, his handprint, his footprint, his fingers on everything that's going on, and then get excited that he's coming. Get excited he's coming. Here's one thing I guarantee in an election year. Somebody's going to be disappointed going to happen. But here's the thing. Our king is coming. Doesn't matter how the election turns out, does it? Something else I know. Someone's going to lose a job. Here's what I know. Your king is coming. Doesn't matter if you lose a job. Here's something else I know. People are going to die. People are going to die. Sickness is going to still be here. People are going to get diagnosed with cancer. People are going to get diagnosed with heart disease. You're going to go to doctors and get bad news. But here's what I also know. Your king is coming. And he's going to come. He's going to make it all right. Every sickness that's diagnosed, he's going to reverse. Even when doctors say you're going to die, you got six to eight months to live. If your doctor says that, guess what Jesus says? Not right. I say you're going to live forever. And I'm your king. He's just a doctor. (laughs) And he's right. Friends, I tell you what, you talk about a witness. Your doctor says you got six to eight months to live. You say, glory! (laughs) My king is coming. 
You don't say, Jesus, don't come for six to eight months. I got six to eight more months. <laughs> Just leave me here as long as you can. I've never met a person going through chemotherapy that said, please, Jesus, let me just do this for a little while longer. But you can rejoice because your king is coming. And whether we take our last breath here and go to meet our king or whether he comes before we take our last breath, the result is the same. Our king is coming. And he will set it all right. Every time you get discouraged, every time you get disappointed, every time something doesn't go the way you want it to go, don't let the devil jump in and mess it all up. You remember that your king is coming and that he will set it all right. And that takes us to the last one. Don't be afraid of the devil. I've jumped ahead. The, that's going to be the point. The enemy has accomplished nothing. This, this is more important. The enemy, back up, back up. Sorry, that's me. The enemy has accomplished nothing. Hear this. The enemy has accomplished nothing. Now this is where we have been lied to over and over again because this is what the church has been saying too much. Look at everything the enemy's doing. Look at everything the enemy has done. Look at every, oh, the enemy's here, enemy's here, enemy's here, enemy's here. Look what the devil's doing, look what the devil's doing, look what the devil's doing. We're looking at what the devil's doing way too much. Because the devil hadn't done squat. The devil's done nothing. Look at this passage. Look at this passage. It says, meanwhile, the crowd which had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. Talk about what Jesus had done. This is also why the crowd met him, because they heard he had done this sign. The crowd's excited about what Jesus had done. Then the Pharisees said to one another, you see, you've accomplished nothing. You've accomplished nothing. We've tried so hard to stop him. We've tried so hard to stop everything he's doing, and we've done nothing. He said, look, the world has gone after him. We can't, it, I mean, think about it for a moment. Don't think, think about it. And here, now you can put, don't be afraid of the devil. You can put that up there. It's next. There you go. Boom. Think about this. Think about this. We say, Phew. Bob just keeps getting worse. Bob needs Jesus. Keeps getting worse. Devil's winning in his life. Bob's got a drug problem. Bob's got a relationship problem. Bob's got an employment problem. Bob, Bob, whatever. Just look at all the devil. Look at what the devil is doing in Bob's life. Okay, that's, that's the conversation of the church. Pick a, pick a Bob. We just pick somebody, and we talk about all things devil's doing. Since Jesus died and resurrected... Billions of people have been saved. Not millions. Billions of people. Everybody talks about Islam? Not even close. Buddhism? Not even on the map. Hinduism, atheism, agnosticism. I'll just say, we give these statistics about how lost, but let me tell you what. Nobody has had more followers than Jesus Christ. Don't look at what the devil's doing. Look at what Jesus is doing. Man, he's, he beats the devil at every turn. At every turn. <laughs> when you're praying for somebody and you see God answers those prayers, I mean, think about how many times God answers prayer. I, I am so blessed to be a man who's been to the hospital so many times to have so many occurrences where people are like, they say mom's going to die. Let's pray. We pray. Doctor comes out. Don't know what happened. Mom's going to live. In fact, mom's still alive today. You know, those moms. Yeah, I lost my mom. I lost my mom. That mom I prayed for, she's still alive. I lost my mom. Kim lost her mom. We are a people of hope. And my mom loved Jesus and wanted to be with him. 
The devil didn't win. <laughs> Jesus wins. He wanted to come home, and the devil couldn't stop it. Neither could I. <laughs> you know, you try to get in the way of somebody coming home. Jesus wants somebody to go home. I just want you to think of this. You say, God, don't do it. Don't let them go. Don't take them. We'd say they're dying. But a believer isn't dying. They're just leaving. Their mission is being fulfilled. Their journey has come to an end. And they get to go and enjoy their reward forever. And I know what my mom would say. She'd say, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> I'm getting out of here. Leave you with the mess. <laughs> and that's what's happening. You see, this, again, things we don't understand. Things sometimes the devil gets us confused about us, and we get afraid of what the devil can do. The devil can hurt us. The devil can get to us. The devil can take this away from us. Don't be afraid of the devil. The devil can't do anything. The Pharisees were the religious power of the day. And they put all their effort into destroying Jesus. They came up with a plan, a perfect plan. Perfect plan! They paid off one of his followers, had him arrested. Kangaroo court had him trumped up charges, had him convicted, went to the Roman governor convinced him against his better judgment to have him crucified, and they crucified him. They stuck a spear in him to make sure he was dead. He was dead. Pharisees said, we, we won. Devil says, look, I win. I did it. Three days later, Jesus says, you've won nothing. You've accomplished nothing. And he rises from the dead. And he takes every person who believes in him with him. The devil at the end of time will have nothing. He has won. Nothing. The people who want to go with the devil, God lets him go. God just lets him go. But let me promise you this. If you don't want to go with the devil, if you don't want him to be the one you suffer with for all eternity, Jesus says, there's nothing that can keep you from me. There's no addiction you have. There's no problem you've done, no sin you've committed. There's nothing in your life that's ever happened, no mistake you've made that can keep you from me. After a period of praise, after a period of pain, after a period of pain, there will be only praise. That's what life is. We, you know, darkness comes in the night. We suffer in the night. But joy comes in the morning. Oh, man, I wish I had a picture. Ruby Joy, my new grandbaby. Yeah, I know. So I got, I got, it's on my phone. I, Um, is he really stopping to pull up a picture? Yeah, there she is. So, those of you with eyes. Yeah. Um, after my mom had died, I mean, week later, next week, one week we're having a funeral. Next week, we have a little joy. Don't be afraid to shout. Don't be afraid to look for him. Don't be afraid of the devil. And don't be afraid to receive his salvation. Today we are going to partake of what we call the Lord's Supper. We drink juice and we eat a little piece of stale bread. It is something that Jesus gave to us to remind us of his salvation for us. It was a practice the Jews had already in the Passover. They had a much more elaborate ritual that they did to remember that God saved them from the Egyptians. 
really literally saved him from death because the angel of death came and killed the firstborn of every family. And because they had put blood on their doorpost, God preserved them. The blood of the lamb covered the people in the house. And Jesus came to his disciples as they were celebrating this, and they had been celebrating this for over a thousand years, and it's so they all knew what they were doing. And Jesus said, today, I'm changing this. From now on, don't remember the blood of that Passover lamb. Remember the blood of this lamb. Jesus, the Christ. The blood of the new covenant, he said. Remember my blood shed for you. Remember my body given for you. And today, I don't, don't be afraid. If you've never put, if, if you've received it, it's a time to remember. But if you've never received that salvation, if you do not know his salvation, if you do not know his Holy Spirit, if you do not know he has not transformed you and made you into a new creation, if all these words I'm saying right now are foreign to you, but you would love to have it, to know it, you can know it. That's right. Do not be afraid to be saved. Do not be afraid to be saved. It wouldn't be a shame if you were drowning in the ocean and there were lifeguards all around, but just out of embarrassment, you just let yourself drown. When you're, when you're dying, and you know you're dying, the right thing to do is to cry out for help. Cry out for help. And that's, that's, all, that's what we're doing. It's not a religious exercise. It's not us just getting together and we have, and some people have been told, oh, this is the moment you come forward. No, this is just you. If you need help, if you need to cry out for help, before we remember what he's done, we give you the opportunity to receive it if you've never received it before. If you're not where you need to be with God, maybe you've one, you put your trust in him a long time ago, but you're not trusting him right now. You know things are not right between you and him. This is a moment to make it, to get right with him. Let me tell you, it's not him, it's you. He hasn't left you. He hasn't deserted you. He hasn't abandoned you. You left him. And he says, I'm right here. Come back to me. Just turn around. It's called repentance. Repentance just means turning around and going back to Jesus. I've said this before. It feels like when you're far, far away from him, it feels like you've got to turn around you know, man, I'm so far from Jesus. But what you don't realize is when you turn around, it's like, oh, he's right there. He's right there. He's been waiting for you to turn around the whole time. Father, just thank you, God, for how good and amazing you are. And Lord, in this time, I just pray, Father, we would turn around and see you. Either we're walking with you and we're praising God that we're walking with you and we're celebrating that, or we're walking away from you. What a great opportunity to turn around and realize walking away from you has not gotten us where we want to go. Lord, if, if we still think we have the power to save ourselves, Lord, then we're not hearing this. But I'm not talking to those people. I'm talking to the people, Lord, who know they need to be saved. Who know they've gotten lost. Who know they've gotten off track. Lord, forget whatever prayers we prayed in the past. Forget whatever good things we've done in the past. Forget how many times we've come to church. Lord, show us where we are right now, right at this moment. Are we walking away from you? Or are we walking with you? Lord, if we're walking away from you, may this be a moment we turn around and embrace you again. Maybe embrace you for the first time. But Lord, know and believe that you are our king and you will save us. You will deliver us from whatever it is we face. You will indeed deliver us from death. And that's what we want. We want deliverance. So we turn to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me as we have a time invitation. Time invitation. I know the hour grows late. But I want to give you the opportunity to respond. Before we remember what he's done, we need the opportunity to receive what he's done for you. I'm right here. Clayton's here. Randy's here. It's not a talent show. You don't have to say, I don't want to pray with Clayton. <laughs> but we're here to pray with you if you need us. That's why we're here. But we want to pray with you if you need help and assistance. If you want to pray on your own, you're welcome to come up. But right now, before we celebrate his salvation, make sure you know his salvation as we say. Are you thirsty? Are you empty? Come and drink these living waters.
waters tired and broken peace unspoken rest beside these living waters Christ is calling find refreshing hit the cross of living waters lay your life down all the old gone rise up in these living waters there's a river that flows with mercy and love bringing joy to the city of our god there our hope is secure do not fear anymore is the lord of living waters spirit moving mercy watching healing in these living waters lead your children to the shoreline life is in these living there's a river that flows with mercy and love, bringing joy to the city of our God. There our hope is secure, do not fear anymore. Praise the Lord of living waters. Are you thirsty? Are you empty? Come and drink these living waters. The forgiveness, vast and boundless, Christ, he is our living waters. Come on, sing. There's a river that flows with mercy and love bringing joy to the city of our God. There our hope is secure, do not fear anymore. Praise the Lord of living waters. There our hope is secure, do not fear anymore. Praise the Lord of living be seated and our deacons would come forward while they're coming forward tell you about Lila has given her heart to Jesus and has wanted to talk more about being baptized and we'll just celebrate that for a second <clears throat> what's getting ready to happen is we're going to pass out these cups and as they're passed out uh, just you'll have two cups and they will be uh, need to be carefully separated. The bread is in the bottom cup and the juice in the top one. And uh, as they are separated, hold them each in your hands. This Lord's Supper is for all baptized believers. So those who've put their faith in Jesus and been baptized in obedience to him are welcome to participate in this meal together with us. And uh, we, uh, if you are visiting for another church and you are a baptized believer, we welcome you to participate with us. But uh, as you, se you separate them, hold them, we will pray over the bread and partake. We will pray over the juice and partake. But you guys go ahead and distribute those elements to people.
I hate to be a little unorthodox, but there are three pieces of bread up here <laughs> without a cup. Is there someone who doesn't have bread who needs bread? Yes, you're like, why are you embarrassing me in front of all these people? But so if everybody has bread who needs bread. There's somebody, is everybody good? One right here. One right here. Okay. Tim Miller, would you ask the blessing on the bread? and they, uh, it was the third cup of that night, again, representing the Passover lamb, but this time he said, this is the blood of my new covenant. So, uh, Brad, would you mind asking a blessing upon the cup? Amen. Jesus said, this is my blood which is shed for you. Drink it in remembrance of me. And they sang a hymn together. If you would, stand with us as we all sing Amazing Grace. Asked God to said, "Hey God, let's make this message short today, and uh, so we can get out of here by 11:35." So you see how much pull I have in that conversation. But I want to share a story with you before we leave. A man and his son went to an Orthodox church, and they had some incense. And he said, "Dad, what's the incense?" He explained what the incense means, and they had all these vestments. And he said, "Dad, what do those vestments mean?" He explained what all the vestments mean, and so forth. Just all kinds of different. Explained all the different aspects of the room and the worship. They went to a Baptist church the next week. And the preacher took his watch off and set it on the pulpit. And he said, Dad, what does that mean? He says, it don't mean a thing, son. It don't mean a thing. <laughs> Let me pray this out. Father, we just thank you, God, for how great and amazing you are. Lord, be with us as we leave here today and go with us as we go out into the world. Lord, I pray, Father, as we remember your body and blood shed for us, may it fill our hearts with excitement. Father, may we not forget... Lord, that you are the victor, and Lord, that you are our king, and may we go out as, uh, as children, as more than conquerors in Jesus Christ, and go out into the world, and go out and invite people to come back into your place, Lord, so that we might see those lives changed and transformed by your power, if we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.